Do our pets continue to visit us after they die and how do we know if they are visiting us? Can we reach out and communicate with them either in our dreams or through other means? Are our pets greeted by our deceased family members when they pass on and what are the things we can do to improve our chances of making a connection with them? What is it like for our pets on the other side? And what can we do to help ourselves deal with the grief of losing our pets? Join me and best-selling author, psychic, and animal communicator Karen Anderson as we explore these questions and more. Well, hello out there, everyone, and welcome once again to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and it's so wonderful to be back with you once again uh, for another great episode And uh, this time I've got uh, world-renowned psychic and animal communicator Karen Anderson joining me. And uh, Karen is the author of the best-selling book, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, Messages and Signs from Our Pets on the Other Side. So, so exciting to have Karen joining me. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with her. Uh, I want to talk about a recent Facebook poll that I did. And uh, the Facebook poll question was, do you believe the world is starting to have a spiritual awakening? And uh, in the poll, 131 people voted, and 71 people voted yes to the question, while 60 people voted no. So thank you so much for uh, everyone that participated in the poll. So it came out 54% yes and 46% no. And uh, this is really one of the closest polling questions I've had in terms of percentages of votes. So that was interesting how that one came out. Again, thank you for participating in that poll if you did. And the other thing I wanted to mention is make sure you head over and visit the uh, Passion for the Paranormal website. It's at passion, the number four, theparanormal.com. And uh, you can go on there and sign up to receive or get on distro for the Passion for the Paranormal newsletter. And uh, on that newsletter, I put out a lot of good information about upcoming episodes and recent past episodes and uh, a little bit of information about guests that have been on the show and uh, any other important events or information uh, to put out. And uh, so if you sign up for that newsletter, you're not being put on a mailer list or anything like that. It's simply to receive the newsletter. Uh, You can also catch up with past episodes on the uh, website. You can blog about topics we've covered in past episodes. And you can also check out books and other materials from past guests. So uh, also please remember that it is always free to listen to all the Passion for the Paranormal episodes, but it is not free to produce the show. So in addition to subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show, uh, there's other ways you can support the show. You can also access the Amazon links on the website to purchase books and other content from past guests. Now we are an Amazon affiliate, so if you do click on the Amazon links to purchase items on the site, a small portion will go to helping us to offset the cost of doing the show. So in addition, coming soon, please look out for opportunities to become a Passion for the Paranormal patron and help support the show. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into the discussion with Karen and uh, really hope you enjoy tonight's episode. Okay, so my guest tonight is uh, award-winning animal communicator and psychic Karen Anderson. Karen is also the best-selling author of the book, The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, Messages and Signs from Our Pets on the Other Side. Karen, thank you for joining me on the show tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. And um, what, a, what a fascinating topic. Um, you know, so many of us have pets that are so near and dear to our hearts uh, I just uh, lost a couple of mine just recently over the last year. They were, they were sisters from the same litter, and and uh, you know it, it's uh, you know I read the book, went through the book, it's some some amazing stories, and uh, it just it, it it kind of is, it's good to think that they're you know on the other side, kind of looking over. But can you talk just a little bit about your journey? And it's interesting journey. You talk about it in the book, but can you talk about that journey that eventually led you into the work you do now as a psychic and animal communicator? Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, you know, looking back on it now, it all makes sense. But at the time, boy, it seemed like a crazy uh, wild ride. So as far back as I can remember, like my earliest memories, I could communicate with my childhood pets. Now, that was on a very beginner level, you know, a very elementary level. It was nothing like what I do today. But, you know, I have silly little conversations with them, and I thought everyone could. I didn't realize that it was something different or unique or unusual. 
And it wasn't until I started telling my parents things about our pets and also our departed human ancestors, because I could see human spirits too, and it kind of scared them. They didn't quite know what to do with that, so they told me to knock it off, <laughs> basically. <laughs> they told me I had an overactive imagination and, you know, stopped talking to the dog, and they got really nervous, and they just didn't know what to do with all that. So I learned at a very early age that I had to cover it up and not tell anybody. So for a very long time, that's what I did. I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. And uh, it wasn't until many, many years later when I was a deputy in Colorado, that's where everything started to snowball. I worked in a mountain district, and I often worked by myself because it's a very, very small department. There were only eight of us, and I was the only female officer on the department. And so you would often work your entire shift with uh, no backup car. So I'd have to respond to all calls for help and really be aware of my surroundings and if someone's intent was to harm me. And I became very in tune to listening to that little voice in my head. I got very good at reading energy in a room or the energy of a suspect or things that were happening on a crime scene. I started paying attention to body language. And I basically had a spiritual awakening of sorts because truly the bottom line is my life depended on it. My safety and my life depended on it. And that's where everything just went crazy. And crazy meaning I started getting all kinds of information from from the animals. Now here was the clincher. I was on a crime scene. I was actually talking to a victim and the resident cat, her kitty, told me where a suspect was hiding. Now, it didn't come out and say, oh, you know, he's over there, or he's here, or he's there. The, the cat came out of the house, looked right at me, and I heard the words, inside. Well, the cat was standing right next to a garden shed, which had already been searched by a fellow officer. And I thought, there's no way he could be in there, because he had fled on foot, and we didn't know where he was. So sure enough, I went over there and ordered him to come out with his hands up, and lo and behold, there he was. Wow. So that's when everything kind of shifted for me. Interesting. Now, your, um, your mention of, uh, you know, your family not really being accepting of that, I've heard that from other psychics and mediums I've had on the show and uh, now, did you have anybody else in your family that had this kind of gift like you did? If they have it, uh, they really didn't practice with it. They didn't sharpen those skills because it's just like anything else. If you are a golf player or you play tennis or piano, it's, it's like any other skill. You have to sharpen it. You have to practice. You have to utilize those abilities or they go away. And they aren't as sharp. They aren't as clear. And I, I do have, I, I believe, very strong psychic family members, but they don't use it because it scares them. They don't know what to do with it. And they, of course, you know, are more understanding now because of the work that I do. But there is not, you know, one particular person in my family that I can point to and say, well, that person is where I got it from. I think it's something that is passed down it's you're either more inclined to it or less inclined to it i happen to be more inclined to it and my whole family just thought i was nuts you know first they were they thought i was nuts because i wanted to be a cop and then i they thought i was really nuts when i announced i was going to be a, a pet psychic <laughs> they thought oh she's she's lost her mind now <laughs> she's <laughs> crazy so uh i i'm guessing you probably are able to uh also converse or, or speak with spirits uh, of people, is that correct? I mean, is it kind of just uh, both animals and people that you're able to communicate or connect with? Yes, it's actually the same process. So when I communicate with an animal, whether they're living or deceased, the way that I connect with them is generally through a photo. So let's say you had an, a session with me with one of your um, departed puppy dogs, 
you would ahead of time send me their picture and tell me their name and their age and if they were living or passed on. And I use that photo to basically dial up their energy. It's like having that pet's cell phone number. And I'm able to just make the connection very quickly. That's how I train myself. And what started happening was I never intended to connect with departed human spirits, but they came through. And I couldn't stop them. I'd be having a session with somebody's departed cat or departed dog, and their mom or dad or grandma or sister or brother or uncle or somebody would show up. And it started happening more and more and more. And I realized, wow, they are together on the other side. They come through together. So if you have um, a session and we're connecting with a departed pet, chances are very good that one of your, if not more, one of your departed loved ones will come through. Because they see it as an opportunity to say hello or to send a message or to let you know that they're around. And who wouldn't want to get a message through? So they, they'll pop in and, and send a message. Now, does that kind of sometimes uh, get in the way a little bit of the um, session, the animal communication session? You know, it doesn't really because I always give the client the uh, prerogative to say where they want me to go. So if I am feeling that there's a departed human coming through, I'll tell them who I think it is, and they can decide right then and there if they want to hear from them or not. And I very gently and very politely, if they don't want to talk to them, I very gently and politely ask them to step aside. And um, I'm always very respectful of the spirits that come through. I'm always very polite and considerate because I know that they're very anxious usually to be heard and to let their loved ones know that they're okay. And uh, I, I just treat them with respect. So most of the time, people want to hear from whomever. I mean, they're usually excited to hear from whoever wants to come through. Right. That, yeah, that would make sense unless there was kind of a, you know, maybe a little bit of a troubled relationship on, uh, on this side. I would think maybe that could cause a little bit of tension. But I wanted to uh, step back again for just a minute. When do you... When was that first moment you remember actually knowing that you had this gift? I mean, was it at a very, very young age? You know, I did I did at a very young age have that sense, but I didn't know what to do with it. So just being young and not knowing how to control it, you know, I always had good experiences. I could see spirits, but they were always very friendly, very nice very pleasant. It was always really positive. And, you know, for a while there, Corey, I, I actually turned those abilities off because I just felt like I wasn't supposed to be doing that and my family didn't support it. And so I just turned it off for a really long time and, and just kept it quiet. But it truly was a an awakening of sorts when I was on the department. That's where everything started to happen. That's where everything started to just really explode and I realized that there was no way I was going to be able to ignore it anymore I needed to do something with all of that and then once I realized what I had my abilities I dove in I wanted to learn everything I could about it I studied really hard I practiced all the time I was fascinated by the topic and back then you know there weren't really computers like there are now, they were just coming out and you know, Google and the internet and all that, that wasn't there. If you wanted to find out about something, you'd have to go to a library or go to a bookstore. So it was a, a different kind of learning curve than today. So it evolved over time and it turned into a full-time job. I ended up leaving law enforcement to devote myself and my work to uh, the psychic realm. Interesting, yeah. And the the question I I've had uh, a few other psychics and mediums on the show, and I would just kind of I always like to ask this question because I'd like to get your take on it. Um, do you think this uh, the psychic or medium ability? I mean, is it really something an innate ability that you need to be born with, or do you really think there is uh, there we all have the power to harness it? Um, you know, I mean, in other words, is, is it something we can learn to turn into or is it really something you're kind of born with? You either have it or you don't. 
Well, I do believe that everybody has the innate ability to learn the basic skills of how to communicate with animals, how to com communicate with departed um, human loved ones, but I do feel that based on people's belief systems and their support systems that there are some people that will just be too closed-minded and too closed off to be able to grasp it. And it, there's kind of that, um, that, you know, for those who are really devoted and want it and believe it can happen, they're going to have a much easier time than, let's say, somebody that doesn't believe in it and thinks it's all a bunch of hooey, that is a skeptic, naysayer, or cynic, you know, they're, they're not going to have a lot of success. That's just the nature of the beast. So I believe everyone does have the ability. It's just what their belief systems are and what their present outlook is on tackling that topic. And uh, I, you know, I'm a paranormal investigator, and in addition to doing the show I do here, so I'm certainly open to it uh, and, and want to try and connect. And uh, I've had this conversation with another psychic medium. Uh, the challenge is I've tried to do it uh, either with family members or even with my, my two dogs that uh, I, I, I lost two dogs that over the last year. And uh, it, it's something, you know, you, somebody like me, I really want to genuinely connect. And, and maybe at times I thought, well, maybe they are here. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not like I'm able to have a conversation or communicate. Um, what, what can we do, like, initially? Is there any kind of, um, you know, things that you can, you can tell us at least uh, right now that may be able to allow us to tune in to, and to know that maybe our pets are here and uh, watching over us? Well, I think you first and foremost, you have to want to receive a message. You have to be open to the fact that energy is all around us. If you'll stop for a moment and think about all of the cell phones that are going at any one given time, how many people are talking to each other, how many people are texting each other, think about all those radio waves that are out in the atmosphere. You can't see them. But has your phone ever failed you? Have you ever dialed a number and you can't get through? Yeah, of course. There's always little blips in the atmosphere. There's little things that happen with the lines and whatever. So if you believe it can happen, if you believe that there is a, an energy that you can tap into and you want that to happen, that's the first step. You really have to have the right perspective. You have to have that open mind. And trust what you get. If you think you're getting a message from a loved one, whether it be human or animal, if you get a sense or a feeling that they're near, tell them. Say, I, I can feel you. I can sense you around me. Give me some kind of a sign. Let me know that you're there. If you engage with them and ask them to give you more or to give you another sign, they will usually do that. They, they get so excited when we actually acknowledge them. So I think what you can really do is just start with your perspective and just trust and believe that it is possible. I've been doing this now for over 20 years, and I, I have so many amazing messages that have come through where the animals, departed animals, share what's currently going on in their humans' lives, even though they've passed on. They, they can share present-day things with me. They can share health issues that their humans are going through. It's shocking, it's amazing, and it's incredible, and that's why I love it. I can't explain it. I have a pretty good idea of how it works, but to me it's just fascinating. I mean, how do you explain that a deceased dog, for instance, how can you explain this? I just had a session on Monday of this week where the deceased dog was telling me exactly what his human dad had done last weekend, including going to a golf course. Now, I know this client really well, and I know he doesn't golf. So I was like, what in the world? Why would he be going to a golf course? Well, it turns out he was helping set up for a fundraising event 
at a local golf course. Unbeknownst to me, of course, I had no idea, but his dog told me. So how do you explain that? To me, that's what makes this so fascinating and so amazing is that you never know what they're going to talk about. You never know what they're going to say. And it blows my mind. It really does. Yeah, it's it's intriguing. Uh, now, are, are animals, a lot of times, are they around us after they pass on? Are they still around us most of the time? Are they... Uh, you know, are, are they off doing other things a lot of times or do they have you found that a lot of times they come back and spend a lot of time around their owners? Well, I will tell you this, that immediately after they leave their body, so for the next 24 to 48 hours, 72 hours, right around there, they're very much still connected and I'm going to say focused on us and their body and 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 being here after that 24 hours 48 hours starts to pass by they begin to get more adventurous and they start exploring a little bit more and they're not so focused just on their body and leaving and what we're doing and they start to expand a little bit more but I, I guarantee you this you are and always have been the most important person in the world to your pets, and there's nowhere else that they would rather be than with you. Now, they're not with you 100% of the time. Imagine it's like the first day of summer and you're a kid and you just got the car keys. I mean, you're going to go all over the place, right? You're going to go out with your friends. You're going to go to the movies. You're going to go explore. You're going to go out for a joy ride. You're going to have a good old time. Well, that's what they do, too. But everything then orbits around you. The focus is you, and they're with us a lot, but then they go out and they do these other things. They explore. They have fun. They can do whatever they want to do, and they can be in more than one place at one time. They, they are not restricted by a physical body like we are. They can go do several different things at one time. So if they want to visit you and let's say, go hiking through the woods and go to the beach all at the same time, energetically, they can do that because everything is done by thought. Everything is an energetic message and energetic thought on the other side. So there's no physicality. There's no restrictions of physical on the other side. What What are some of the signs we can look for? Because, you know, people like me who don't have the gifts that you have, um, what are the signs we can look for that our pet may be there with us and trying to communicate? Well, the most common signs that we get that a departed pet is around is they will come to us in our dreams. When we are in our dream state, we are in a relaxed mode and our brain is more open to receiving a message or a visitation from them. And if you'll notice in your dreams, Curry, there is no talking. Everything is done telepathically in our dreams. You don't have to see somebody's mouth moving to know they're talking to you. You just know that they're happy or you know that they're sad. You just get a sense or a feeling. That's exactly how they send messages to me. They don't have to actually be talking. I get that feeling, that sense. I get that from them. So they'll visit us in our dream state. That's the number one way. And the next most common way is they will usually let you know that they are near by either being in their favorite spot or rubbing up against your leg or being on the end of the bed or wherever their favorite place is or where they spent the most time when they were alive. They're generally there. So if you have a cat or a dog that sleeps on the end of the bed, you will maybe even feel footsteps going across the bed, but when you look down there, there's nothing there, or you'll feel something brush up against you, but when you look, there's nothing there. We can't see them with our eyes, because they're, it's a different, you know from paranormal investigations, there's different uh, um, visual restrictions that we have that we can't physically see them with our eyes. We have to use IR cameras, we have to use all these you know, fancy equipment to be able to actually see spirit activity, but they are there. And they are often in the places that they spent the most time 
or around the people they spent the most time with. So you may also hear something, like you may hear a meow or a cry or a whine or a whimper or a bark. You may hear their tags, like the, the clinking of their tags. You may hear their little uh, toenails on the floor. You may hear the click, 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 click. I've had some departed pets move things, like they move their food bowl or they'll knock something over. I had one deceased Great Dane who his mom had a painting commissioned of his likeness. It was a beautiful uh, oil or acrylic painting, like you know, a huge painting that she was going to put over the fireplace. And this dog was huge. He's about 140 pounds. He knocked the painting over just to let her know it was on the floor. Knocked it over just to let her know that he was there, and he loved it. He thought it was great. He told me about it, and so I told my client, and of course she couldn't believe that I knew that she had a painting commission for him, but the dog told me. So those are just a couple of ways that our pets let us know that they're around, and the biggest mistake you can make is to disregard those messages or ignore them. Because when you disregard or ignore those messages, your pets become discouraged. It doesn't make them go away, but they'll likely not spend all that energy that it takes to send you more messages. So if you think about it, they only have so much energy. They have to draw their energy from somewhere to be able to move something or make a noise or let you know that they're near or manifest in any way. And when we ignore it, they're only going to try so many times and then go, well, mom or dad just doesn't see me or hear me, so I'm not going to try that anymore. So the best thing you can do is to get excited, ask them to give you a sign, ask them to move something or to make a sound or make a noise or just let you know that they're there, and then get really excited when they do and ask them to keep doing it again. And the more that you acknowledge it, the more excited they will get, the more energy you're putting out there into it. They can pull from that energy and actually send you more messages. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. Uh, I, you, almost like you read my mind because I was just going to bring up the topic of dreams next. Um, I very rarely have lucid dreams or ones that I remember it is one that uh, I've asked family members and my pets to come and visit me. Uh, it just never seems to happen. So um, what what can I do? How can we try and uh, make that happen? Um, I would love for my pets to come and visit me, um, you know, my two deceased dogs. And uh, it just hasn't, uh, at least not that I can remember. I'm think, I would think that... If they did visit me, I would probably remember it. Um, what else can you do to try and facilitate that? Well, you have to remember that if the animal was a subtle and quiet and conservative in life, they're going to be the same way in the afterlife. If your pet was outgoing and boisterous and noisy in life, they're going to be the same way in the afterlife. So if you had a very shy and quiet pet, you're probably going to have a hard time picking up on any message from them simply because of the nature of their personality. Even for me sometimes, I have to really work hard and tune in more if the pet is more conservative or quiet or shy or fearful or whatever it was. Whereas if the pet was outgoing and you know very friendly and happy and joyful, boy, those are easy messages to pick up on. So you have to take a little of that into consideration too. The other thing that I would recommend, and this is kind of a secret I'll share with you, is that I have certain tools of the trade that I use to enhance the experience to give the spirits that I communicate with a, uh, a blast of energy, so to speak, so that they can send me more messages. And uh, in paranormal investigations, we basically experience the same thing. You've probably had this happen where you've gone in with brand new batteries in your camera, brand new batteries in your uh, digital voice recorders, Everything has brand new fresh batteries. You walk into a potentially active area and what happens? All your batteries drain, right? Right. It's it's happened a number of times to me on investigations. Right. 
And what usually happens is you'll start getting some paranormal activity. You'll get EVPs, you'll get uh, manifestations, you'll get things being moved, you'll get touched, you know, all these things can happen. Because what are they doing? They're pulling energy from your batteries. So my little secret weapon is I go to Costco and I get one of those gigantic multi-packs of batteries. I have that sitting on my desk at all times, and I replace it. You know, I have to get new ones in every once in a while, so I bring them in because the spirits will literally pull their energy from those batteries during a communication session. It's like having a little battery pack for them right there. I make it very inviting and very easy for them to communicate. Your pets need a source of energy, so you can simply do that by having either a battery pack like I suggested. There's other methods too, such as certain crystals have very powerful energy sources with them, within them, particularly quartzes. Quartz is known as a very high conductor of energy. There's other things too, such as uh, smudging, saging, using Palo Santo, which is a cleansing ritual where it removes the negative energies from a room. Also, moving water. Water is a very high conductor of energy. So, you know, in paranormal investigations, where do we have a lot of activity? Where there's moving water, and there are certain other stones. I want to say, is it limestone? There's a certain stone. Right. Anyway, Limestone's one of them I, that they say you is... You know what is I mean? where it conducts the energy more. So wherever there's moving water, wherever there's an energy source, there tends to be a higher chance of paranormal activity. Well, think that your pets on the other side, your departed pets, need a source of energy to communicate with you. Otherwise, you probably won't feel them, sense them, or know they're near because you're not tuning into it. You're not paying attention to it. You have a lot of uh, chatter going on in your brain, you're thinking about what's for dinner, you have to go to the grocery store, I mean, you're really not tuning into them. So they need a source of energy to let you know that they're there. You can create this little corner in your house or a little area in your house where you provide them with a spiritual fuel, and they will use it. They will let you know that they're there. I even take a little um, wind chime that is super light, not one of these big, heavy, uh, metal ones, but a super light wind chime, and put it in the corner of a room where you know there is no breeze or no window that will affect it or no draft or heater vents or air conditioning vents. Put it in a corner that you know is static and ask your pets to move the wind chime for you to let you know when they're around. It has to be very lightweight material, of course. And then make a big deal about it when it actually happens. I've even had some clients tell me that they have seen their pets' names pop up, like on their phone. They've seen it on uh, license plates of cars. They've seen it on billboards, uh, in a song, on the radio. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. Electronic equipment is another way that our pets let us know that they're around. Their, their picture will pop up on your phone for no reason. I mean, it's crazy all the things they do. Wow. You mentioned a story in the book uh, related to a guy's alarm clock. Can you touch on that story real quick? A client of mine had a, a dog that passed away, and he contacted me for a session. And when I get messages from animals, I don't know necessarily what the message means. They might flash an image of something to me, or they might say the word of what it is, or they might try to describe it. And during this one particular session, the dog kept showing me an alarm clock. You know, this is uh, old-fashioned style. Now we have our cell phones, but this was an old-fashioned style alarm clock. And so I asked his dad, who was on the phone with me, you know, what does this mean to you? And he said that for the last uh, few weeks, ever since his dog passed away, the alarm clock kept going off by itself at like 5.30 every morning or whatever time it was. And he says it was driving him crazy because he didn't set it. He, he didn't have it set for 5.30, and yet the alarm clock would go off. Well, it just so happens that dog showed me the alarm clock and said that he was the one that was setting it off because he and his human dad 
used to get up every morning at 5.30 and go for a run. Hey everybody, this is Curry here. I really hope you enjoy listening to the Passion for the Paranormal podcast show, but did you know that you can actually get paid just for listening to this podcast? I know it sounds insane, but it's true. I discovered this free new app called PodCoin, and it literally pays you to listen to podcasts. So here's how this works. You listen to podcasts and you earn PodCoin while you listen. Then you turn that PodCoin in for gift cards at places like Amazon or Starbucks. And if you're a really good person, you can even donate that PodCoin to charity. So the more you listen, the more you earn. So here's what you do. Download the app right now on iPhone or Android. And I have a special code for you. Simply use the code PARANORMAL and you'll get 300 PodCoin just for signing up. And if you listen to enough podcasts on there, you can get a cappuccino at Starbucks or an Amazon gift card on us. So go ahead and listen to this podcast or virtually any podcast on PodCoin and sign up with the code, once again, PARANORMAL. It will change the way you listen to podcasts. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was a fascinating story. Um, And and one of the other things you touch on in the book is um, when we ultimately have to, and I had to deal with this twice over the last year about the decision to to actually euthanize our pets and and it's a difficult one and it it was really an emotional roller coaster for me and my wife for both of our dogs and uh, I think you kind of go through this guilt phase and and um, at one moment for me at least I was thinking um, you know especially for the first one I was thinking wow she is in bad health and it was almost as if she was trying to tell me that it was time to go but uh, then the next day or, the, or, you know, a few days later, I'm saying, am I, you know, I, I'm kind of already making the decision here. And then I'm thinking, am I making the right decision? Am, am I really truly making the right decision? I mean, this is, uh, you know, my dog that had been with me 14 years. And, uh, and it truly was a tough decision. And, and, you know, we all have to go through that. Most of us do anyways if we own an animal for for a long point of, you know, a long period of time. But I I guess my question is, do the animals ever communicate with you, either cats or dogs, um, about um, maybe their humans not making the decision at the right point? I mean, again, this is a, this is a tough one. Um, And again, you know, we often feel guilt sometimes when we have to make the decision, but do they ever communicate anything like that to you? Well, I will tell you something, Curry, that in the 22 years or so that I've been doing this and thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions that I have logged, not one single time has a departed pet ever said to me that they were upset at their human for making that decision to end their life. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We usually keep them here too long because we're not ready to let them go and because nobody wants to make that decision right. So we're just hoping that they pass in their sleep very quietly and very peacefully. And then, you know, we're kind of pushed into making the decision when they start to go into crisis. So I've had pets actually tell me that they were grateful that their human helped them make their transition because they were really ready to go. So it's quite the opposite. They don't see it that it is our decision. They don't see it that we took their life. They see it that their body is failing them and that we as their moms and dads are helping them leave a body that no longer serves them. They don't get upset by that. We do. But they don't see it that way and they don't get upset about that because animals understand on a very high level that life continues on after death they don't fear death like we do now that's a human concept to fear death but animals see it as a natural part of their experience and the only thing that upsets them is us when we get overly emotional when we start focusing only on their uh, health issues and their illnesses or their disease or whatever it is they have that's what upsets them But it is a very natural process that animals accept very readily, 
and they don't see it that we are ending their lives. They don't hold us responsible. I have so many clients ask if their pet forgives them for euthanizing them. There's nothing to forgive. Now, if you set out to intentionally harm your pet, different story. I mean, that's completely different, but that just doesn't happen with my clients. I have the best clients in the world. They love their pets. They do every day whatever they can to help their pet, to manage them, to cure them, to heal them, to feed them, take care of them, love them. These are people devoting their whole lives to the health and well-being of their pet. That pet is not suddenly going to turn on you the moment that they're ready to leave their body and say, how could you do this to me? They're just, just not going to happen. Right. It's so against the love that they feel from you, they know that you're coming from a good intention in your heart. They know that you mean well. They understand that on a very high level. Now, no animal that I've ever spoken to has ever wanted to die. Like, they don't have, uh, they're not, you know, there's no such thing as suicidal pets. There is a very strong will to survive. That's called instinct. It's called Mother Nature. So when you take your pet to the vet office, when you have that appointment and you're going to have to make the decision to end their life, you have to realize that you're working against eons and eons and eons of instinct to survive. So they're going to fight it. Their body is, you're going to see reactions and, and uh, what looks like a struggle. You're going to see them fighting for their last breath. Some of them will slip away very quickly depending on you know what level that they're at. But you have to understand that's not a statement saying you made the wrong decision. That's a statement saying that they're a dog or a cat and they have this instinctual drive to survive no matter what. So don't get that confused because I have some clients contact me that are just beside themselves saying, oh, my God, they were struggling and fighting and, and it was horrible. That's just the physical reaction of the body. The, the spirit of the animal, the soul of the animal, zooms out of that body, flies out of that body. It's like a, a blast, a launching out of that body, and it feels so good to them. The experience is so amazing to them. Nothing like what you and I endure here as we make that final decision. They are literally in a new space, a new place. They're feeling fantastic. They're launched out of those bodies. It's an incredibly powerful, loving experience, and they honestly sometimes don't understand why we're so upset. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why is mom and dad so sad? I'm still here. I'm around them. I'm with them. So it's a very different perspective. You have to try not to put your human perspective onto the animal. That's, that's interesting. So um, would it be fair to say... Uh, well, let me phrase it in a question rather than the way I was just going to say it. Um, that animals kind of intuitively, when they're here on this side, have a an idea of life on the other side. Do they? Because I know um, some people think that their pets sense spirits around. Um, you know, whenever maybe a family member who's passed on may be visiting, or they think their place may be haunted. Um, they think their pets pick up on that, um, sense it, and sometimes maybe they act weird or they, they re, you know, they react in kind of a strange way. Has that been, based on your experience, uh, the way pets experience it? Do they kind of have an innate understanding of the other side while they're here with us on this side? I would agree with that. In, in many different ways, they are able to sense and pick up on spirit energies. If you've ever had to say goodbye to one pet and then you still have another pet at home, sometimes they grieve. That, that remaining pet will grieve the loss and they become very despondent and you can see physical signs of grief and depression. And yet other times they act as if nothing happened and it's like life continues on and they're happy-go-lucky and it's like no big deal. I think it individually depends on the pet, how sensitive they are, how highly evolved that pet is. 
for instance, you know, we can touch on reincarnation. If a pet has been here quite a few times, they're more savvy. They've been around the block more. They have way more experiences than, let's say, a pet who hasn't been here that often. So a pet that has been here with you time and time and time and time again, on a very high level, they have an understanding. They know what happens. They have a sense of it. Where a pet that has not reincarnated so many times, you know, they're still trying to figure things out and, you know, things are still a little bit new to them or not quite as clear to them. So it's very individual and it's, 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 every case differs. Every case is unique. I've had pets that have gone into total depression when a companion animal dies and yet I've had other pets, they almost become like, young again and get frisky again and start acting crazy and like woohoo so it's a crazy thing I, I can't I can't put a general answer on certain things because every pet is different and every situation is different but I do think that they do have an understanding and a sense that things do continue on the other side and they do not fear it they see it as a natural occurring event in fact in the wild if humans aren't in the picture you know, when an animal is nearing the end of their life, it is a natural behavior for that pet to separate itself from the herd or the pack or the colony or whoever that it was hanging out with in life. It's natural for them to separate and go off by themselves to make their transition to pass away. Now, that's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of it is just a survival tactic. In doing that, separating themselves, they're less likely to draw predators in to the rest of the pack or the herd or the colony. But it's also, in the animal kingdom, it's very undignified. The animals see it as very undignified for others to see them in a state of failing health. They want to be viewed and they want to be remembered and they want us to talk about them as happy, healthy, and whole. It's just like you and me, Curry. I mean, we don't want someone talking about all of our health issues and everything that we have wrong with us. You know, we want people to talk about us and remember us for, you know, the good things we did and how fun we were or how much joy we brought to them. And the animals are the same way. So they want to be remembered as being happy, healthy, and whole. They want to leave this earth the same way they came into this world with dignity. So try to make a decision when the pet is not in crisis. If the pet goes into crisis, that makes them feel less dignified. It makes them feel very vulnerable. And it puts them into a panic state before they leave their body. It's a much easier transition if that pet is peaceful and quiet and relaxed and you're relaxed and everybody's calm than if everything is chaotic and crazy. I know it's hard to do sometimes, but if you can, try to do that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, in the book, you also talk about the concept of soul groups, and uh, you know, I've, I've read about this before, and uh, and, and, you know, I've heard about this as well. Do our deceased pets typically stay with certain soul groups, and is it oftentimes involve some of our family members who've already passed on? Okay, for, for some reason, our connection got really weird there, and I didn't hear the question. I, I uh, was asking about, because you touch on the topic of soul groups in your book. And uh, my question is, do our pets, when they pass on, do they typically, are they typically with a soul group? And are these soul groups sometimes our deceased family members? Okay, a soul group. Yes. Okay. Now I, I heard it the first time I couldn't catch that. So it's my belief and my understanding. Now this is just from my experiences, from the communications that I have had over the last two decades is that we come into our lifetime with a certain soul group, a certain group of souls that we agree to have experiences with for the purposes of our own spiritual growth. Now that's 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's not all just good because, honestly, Curry, we don't learn anything when things are good. <laughs> right. We learn as humans when things are really hard, really traumatic. That's where we have to dig in deep, right? That's where we have to really test our faith and our belief system and we have to think outside the box and we have to open our perspective when things are really hard, difficult, traumatic. That's when we experience the uh, an incredible amount of growth within our own soul and spiritual nature of who we are. So we come into this world with a certain soul group, loved ones, humans, family members, friends, coworkers, next door neighbors, and animals. And it's already determined. We already know who we're coming into this world with. We all have a certain sense of how we're going to interact. We, we have certain choices. We can either you know, turn left or turn right or go straight. I mean, we certainly have free will and we can make certain choices throughout our lives. But we agree to come into this lifetime with our soul group, which includes animals. And that is something that I see time and time again. So when I'm communicating with a deceased pet, then everyone in that person's soul group can come through. Deceased human loved ones, deceased pet loved ones, they can all come through, and sometimes they do during a session. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, I always think about that concept of, you know, once we pass on and coming back and and, and uh, the idea of reincarnation, I don't know, I almost think of it as kind of troubling because I think once I pass on to that other side, I'm not sure I want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? This has been a, a hard... A hard time here and, and truly here's my take on that once you have experienced what it's like on the other side you'll resonate with that even more it's like why in the world would you want to come back here I mean it's like being on vacation all the time right versus coming here and having to work every single day of your life on earth so truly I have those same thoughts too it's like oh my god I don't want to come back here and certainly I believe that if it's in the highest and best interest of, of each of us to return, if it's in a, an agreement, a soul contract, if you will, to return, then we can make that decision to return. But I do believe everything in the future is flexible and everything is fluid. I don't think there's ever anything that is uh, in concrete. I think things change and things progress with different situations and different opportunities. There certainly isn't a rule book floating around out there that says, oh, you know what, Curry, sorry, but you're coming back. You know, you're, I'm going to send you back here in two weeks, so live it up while you're here because you're going back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that it's like that, but it's all about a soul's growth and spiritual advancement. And I do believe that most of the time, now generally speaking, of course, dogs come back as dogs. Cats come back as cats, horses come back as horses, people come back as people. However, I have seen where they can change and be a different species. Again, it's, it's all about the lessons that that soul will learn and grow from, and if it's in their highest and best interest to come back as a different type of creature or human or vice versa, I think it's possible. Interesting. And, and uh, hopefully this does not sound like a silly question, but I, I have often wondered this, and, and i got to ask it. When, it. when either animals or, or people that pass on the other side, from your experience, do they actually, I mean, are they always um, in motion, or do they rest? Do they sleep like we do on this side? I don't know that it's asleep per se uh, but everything's based on energy so imagine your cell phone you know we can all relate to our cell phone you know we can talk on it all day until that battery runs down right and then we have to put it on a charger I think that it's basically the same way that a spirit a soul on the other side whether they're human or animal they can zip around they can visit loved ones they can go explore have adventures or whatever it is that they're, they're going to do but i think there comes a time where they have to recharge their batteries they have to gather up more energy 
And the one way that you can help your departed pets is to think about topping off their fuel tank with spiritual fuel. Now, their fuel tank would be the equivalent of their heart, and the spiritual fuel would be the equivalent of happy memories, positive thoughts, uh, all the things they did that you loved or made you laugh or the things that were special about them, just having all those thoughts in your mind, not focusing on illness, not focusing on the moment they left their body. They don't want you to focus on that any more than you and I want to focus on the most horrible moment of our lives. They want to talk about only the good times, the happy times. That equals spiritual fuel. So if you imagine every day you want to send your departed pet a blast of energy, just imagine you're topping off their heart with a big blast of spiritual fuel and send them loving thoughts and happy memories. And that's how you can help your pet on the other side. Also, by living a full and happy life, getting another pet, the more love that comes from your heart, the more it benefits your departed pet. So saying you'll never get another pet again because the pain was too much, that's actually a contradiction to your pet. They will benefit more if you get another pet and love on that new pet because that love, that energy goes out into the universe, and guess what? They can absorb that energy. It's it's amazing because when you were talking about that, I suddenly just got this image of my dog. She was a miniature dachshund, and uh, she used to like to sit up on her hind legs to get your attention. And she would kind of uh -huh. do, do this thing so with that, her paw. That is perfect. That's exactly how a message from a departed pet comes through. So now you have to make a big deal about it. You have to tell her thank you for sending me that message and then ask for more. Yeah, that was amazing because it was just like all of a sudden that image was there. And, right. uh, and that's what it's supposed to look like. That's a message right there. Yeah, that that was that was interesting, and uh, yeah, that <laughs> hadn't happened uh, uh, very often. But uh, yeah, that's that image just suddenly was there. Um, what do you so often think it's just our own thought doing that? But no, when it pops in like that, that is definitely your loved one coming through to say, "Hey, I'm here." Yeah, that that's amazing because that as soon as you just got into that discussion, that image popped into my head. One of the other things I want to ask, because you touch on this in the book, how how can people, because, uh, you know, some of us are so closely attached to our pets while they're here with us. And again, I mentioned I had uh, two dogs that were here with me for 14 years, one a little bit longer than the other. How can, uh, what are things we can do to deal with the grief and uh, help us get on with things after our pets are gone? Well, grief is definitely a personal journey, and I highly recommend that you honor all of the feelings of grief, and it can be kind of a roller coaster ride. There's really, really dark times. There's maybe middle-of-the-road times. Uh, there's sadness. There's anger. There's resentment. There's all kinds of things that happen when we're going through our grief. My recommendation is to honor all of your feelings to talk out loud, if not to yourself, to your pet or to a loved one or somebody, and share your experience of what you're feeling. And the more that you acknowledge those feelings and give yourself permission to grieve, the faster you will move through your grief. There is no cure. I wish I had a little bottle of fairy dust I could sprinkle on you, but there is no cure for grief. And it truly is a reflection of very deep love to grieve deeply. So it is truly a reflection of the relationship you had with that pet, and it's important that you honor that because the grieving process is a part of what you and your pet were supposed to experience together. You're not going to harm them with your grief. You're not going to keep them from their journey. You're not going to make them unhappy or sad. They're going to want you to heal as soon as you can, and they're going to be really happy when you move into a healing space, but you will not keep your pet from advancing on their spiritual journey by honoring your grief. Absolutely no way. Interesting. And I just wanted to ask, so if somebody does a session with you, 
um, to try and communicate with their deceased pet. What is uh, what can they kind of expect in a typical session with you? Well, that is a mixed bag of craziness. So let me just share some typical stuff. Uh, the messages that I normally get, they like to talk about their favorite topic, which is themselves. So I'll usually get something about them, their personalities, some little characteristics, some of the things that they like to do. They will rarely talk about things they don't like. It's usually always about what they like. And they will also share little tidbits, uh, flashes of what you are doing, what you have done, or what you are going to do. I can also get um, insight on health issues, either their health issue, your health issues, or maybe somebody else in the family. So think of it as everyone that you're connected to, that you are in the same web, if you will. And when I bring your pet's energy in, Everyone that's in your web, everyone that's in your soul group, I can get access to their information through your pet. They can share that with me. So even if, let's say, your pet passed away and is on the other side with your grandfather, even though your grandfather never met your pet, they can come through together and they can be together on the other side just like they were best buddies, even though they never knew each other in life. So that kind of craziness happens. And then we just get a little bit of everything. I can see sometimes what you had for lunch. They'll show me what you did yesterday. They'll talk about what you did last week or where you're going on vacation. Oh, man, the sky's the limit. It's like anything and everything can come through. You just never know. And uh, so typically, as you said before, um, they're going to share a photo with you or maybe – a name, is that really all that you ask that they share with you, or is there any more than that when they do a session? No, that's pretty much it. I just want the photo of the pet. I will ask for their name, their age, and if they're living or passed on, and really that's all I need, and the rest I just leave it up to the animals. I always let them do the talking because I think it's sometimes much more interesting to hear what the pets have to say than to ask them a bunch of silly questions. So I'm not big on questions, especially if it's something you already know the answer to. I would rather hear what the pet wants to talk about or what they can share about their life or what they can share about you. I think that's far more interesting. And I, I just, uh, I think that's the respectful thing to do is to let the pets share what they want to share. This is their opportunity to speak. This is their opportunity to get their message out. Let's hear what they have to say. What do they want to talk about? Yeah, interesting. Um, now, when when somebody's trying to book a session with you, can they do it now? They, do you do a lot of sessions by phone or, or most of your sessions face-to-face? I don't do any face-to-face sessions. Everything is done over the phone, just like you and I are talking right now. Everything is done over the phone. And uh, it is doesn't, there's no difference in a face-to-face reading versus a phone session. In fact, I think phone sessions are actually better because there's fewer distractions. You know, you sit down at your phone, I sit down at my phone, I'm in the same place doing the same thing I've done for years and years and years. I have a routine I follow, I have a process I follow, and I'm comfortable where I am, I can control my environment. You know, if I go over to someone's house and show up in their house, there's all kinds of craziness that can go on. There might be other pets, there might be kids, there's all these other noises. I mean, it's just too distracting. Right. Well, uh, so once again, the uh, the book is The Amazing Afterlife of Animals, Messages and Signs from Our Pets on the Other Side. And Karen, can you just share for the listeners one where they can find your books and more information about you if they want to schedule a session with you? Absolutely. The book is on Amazon and Audible and Barnes and Noble and Smashwords and Kindle, so you can find it there. And the easiest way to get in touch with me is to go to my website, which is karenanderson.net, very simple spelling, karenanderson.net. And I also offer 
coaching for those who want to learn how to communicate with their pets. It's so easy, Curry. I can teach most people how to do this in 15 minutes or less. It's so simple. I have uh, two different coaching programs I offer. One is an online course, and the other is private coaching. And all of that information is on my website of KarenAnderson.net. Great. Hey, Karen, I, I really appreciate you spending the time with me and chatting with me. It's been a fascinating discussion. And uh, do you have any more books or any more work uh, that's going to be coming out here down the road anytime soon? Well, I have uh, my first book has been out now for about 10 years. It's called Hear All Creatures. And again, you can get that at the same place on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all that and Audible. And I'm actually writing my third book, as we speak. So I'm taking all of the sessions that I've been doing right now and I'm writing the next book which is going to be a continuation of The Amazing Afterlife of Animals. So it's going to be more animals in the afterlife, stories about the afterlife, actual messages from departed animals. So I'm really excited about that. It's just in the writing phase, the manuscript phase phase, but uh, really happy about that and getting that book out into the world. Great. Well, we'll look out for that. Uh, maybe we can talk again down the road, Karen. It's It's been a great discussion, and once again, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Well, thank you so much, Curry, and thanks to all your listeners, and it's certainly been a pleasure, and I appreciate the time tonight. Absolutely. Have a great night, Karen. You too. Okay, so that's going to about do it for tonight's episode. And uh, make sure you join me for next episode when I'll have best-selling author Stephen Holly Martin joining me to talk about his book, Afterlife, The Whole Truth. So uh, it's really, really going to be great to have Stephen joining me on the show. And uh, really hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion tonight and the topic. I thought it was quite fascinating. And uh, once again, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I'm really looking forward to uh, the next episode. And have a great night, everybody.